Music producers, it's Curtis King at CurtisKingBeats.com, and you're listening to another episode of the Curtis King Podcast. Music producers, you're in for a special treat. You asked me to continue this producer interview series, and I am doing my best to make sure that I bring through the heavyweights. And today is, of course, no exception. Crucial Keys. Now, many of you know him as a Grammy Grammy Award winning, multi Grammy Award winning producer. You've known him for producing uh, probably primary for Alicia Keys. I was introduced to him through his production for Nas. Keisha Cole, Christina Aguilera. And this one credit I didn't actually know. It's funny because my mom was so hyped when they did the remake of Shaft. And, right. and I tried to watch the original. And of course, me being a part of the hip hop culture, you just kind of like adopt things. And you just, yeah, you, yeah, even if you yeah, don't yeah. necessarily understand it, but with the remake, when I was able to see Samuel Jackson and just yeah. the thing that stood out to me and still to this day is the music behind that particular movie. And it's one of my favorite movies of all time. But I had no idea wow. that you were credited as a composer behind that. But Crucial Keys, man, you, you, oh, thanks, you are man. joining us at, the, you know, with the, the music producer community. How you doing, first of all, today? I'm doing good, man. Blessed, man. Another day above ground. You know what I'm saying? I, I, <laughs> I completely agree with that. For starters, so who is Crucial Keys and what artists and records not that you've produced for, but that you are most, how can I put it, most proud of producing for? Oh, man. Crucial Keys is actually Kerry Crucial Brothers. You know, I am, uh, I started out as an aspiring MC, got into production just to have stuff to rap on. And then people started asking me for beats and production. And then the next thing you know, I became this R&B producer, <laughs> which wasn't the original plan. Right. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just a work in progress, brother. I'm just a work in progress. Like you said, uh, I'm mainly known for, you know, uh, the main music partner for Alicia Keys. I've co-produced and co-written on her first four albums and also co-written on her Unplugged album, one of the probably the last MTV Unplugs they've ever done. Wow. And, you know, I've, I've worked with, at the list you said, and also a Somalian rapper via Toronto by the name of Kanon, you know what I mean, mm. who I actually got back in the studio with him recently. Um, we have done, I've done a song with him in the past called Waving Flag. Some of you might have heard of it, you know what I mean? And now we're just working on some new stuff. And um, I... I the hardest thing for me to do is talk about myself. Yeah, well, I mean, well, aside from from the accomplishments, what about on a, on a personal level? Because I, I, you know, we we've had conversations, yeah. you know, just just about maybe that's that'll be a a good uh, uh, shift away from just the professional uh, yeah. credits. Uh, who, who 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 do people know you as? Who've just known you as a friend? Who would they know I, you as? I mean, they know me. Most people say, "Yo, that's a good dude. That's a cool dude. That's a that's a, a real father." You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I take very much pride in being a father. You know what I mean? As as, as most people know, me being a father and being there and just being a you know a sign of inspiration for my children and other, and youth in general. Man, I, I always get in this role of kind of mentoring kids by accident. You know what I mean? Right. It's just that whole sharing that information. And part of that is probably because I didn't have an official mentor growing up besides my father, of course, you know what I mean? Right. And um, yeah, I, I, it, it's more like I just, I just really pride myself into like learning things and sharing it and, you know, dispelling all the lies and the illusions of what life is supposed to be or, or what, or what, uh, you know, you don't have to play this victim that everybody tries to make us Growing up in certain environments, if you know what you know, what I'm talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the, you know, some of the from Bed Stuy to Far Rock Queens, Jamaica Queens to Harlem. You know, in the '80s, you know, '70s to '80s to '90s. So it was like the roughest, you know, degenerate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. world. Right. You ain't supposed to do nothing. So I take pride that being I had a father that put in me early that you don't have to be a product of your environment. You're actually bigger than your environment. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And and, and I think that that's something that a lot of music producers can relate to. And, and it's crazy just to see that, you know, generation to generation, you still have the same 
wild goose chases that producers yeah. are sent on. Uh, I'll give you an example to where my first visit to Guitar Center quite some time ago, okay. you know, I was told that I needed, I went I went in there looking for a microphone and I was told that I needed about $15,000 worth of equipment that I could not afford. And so because of these wild goose chases, it leads me to my next question uh, specifically for you. What equipment and what software do you use to produce your music? Well, you know, I come from a different era, so a lot of that stuff, you know, a lot, a lot of y'all don't even have to use anymore. But <laughs> I, I started with um, a SB12, which turned into a SB1200. The difference is one had a drive and one didn't have an internal drive. Hmm. And uh, Akai S9000, oh no, excuse me, Akai S900, 950. Okay. And then I got the S1000. And basically, you know, I don't know if you want me to break down what each one of them Oh, does. no, feel free. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so basically, you know, you had your SP-1200 for all your drum sounds, all your, you know, snares, blah, 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 blah. And you put your loops in the Akai S-1000 for the extra time. Because mm -hmm. at that time, time wasn't a luxury. You had like 10 <laughs> seconds of this, you know, 30 seconds. You know, if you had like a minute of sampling time, you was the god. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? <laughs> so I started with that four track cassette recorder and and, and a keyboard controller. And uh, uh, I think it was a AKG 414 mic, you know, even the SM57, just your regular basic stuff that I can afford. You know what I mean? Okay. And it, it grew and built from that. But I've done, I did all my sequencing in the, uh, oh, sorry. Then I eventually went over to the MPC 3000 and I was stuck on that for like forever. And right. that became my main sequencer. And, um, you know, time went by. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you make a little more money and you just start upgrading, upgrading. So eventually I went to the DA88s where they're like these mini ADAT tapes. They're okay. Like ones. I remember those. Yeah, I used to use those to record and actually, Alicia's first album, that's what we recorded on. We used oh, to do wow. it in an apartment on the DA88 tapes, MPC, uh, Roland, JB1080, JB2080. Um, did we have the Phantom? No, I don't think the Phantom wasn't out there. Triton. 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 Okay. Uh, shoot, I had shit, man. You gave me the questions. I, no, I, it's I, cool. It's good. It's good because you, the thing is, the thing is, you're you're in an environment full of full of full of young and and all, all ages of producers who are probably sitting in front of their cell phones and notebooks. Like, hold on, let me run that back. What he said. Right, hold on. Right. You can only, oh, so right. you can only do that with this. Okay, but the, it's important for them, and that's why I asked that question. Yeah. Um. So so this one's gonna be a shorter one in that. And I love asking this because I always get a very uh, unique answer from every producer. But I call this the 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 elevator answer. If okay. you were going if you were going between levels and you were somebody, you know, asked you what you did. And they said, hey, how would you describe your sound? How would you describe your sound if you had to in 10 seconds or less? I couldn't. I couldn't, couldn't describe my sound. I, okay. I can only describe what I do. I, I am a great arranger. Like I can mm -hmm. take. Anything you need, you need to complete a project. You need someone to have uh, uh, that that ability to make a project cohesive or make a statement. I'm the guy you call for. Of course, I didn't know that at first. Right, right. I mean, but that is pretty much my strength. Like you know, and it comes from digging in and finding samples and putting stuff together and knowing when to, okay, this is too monotonous. Take this out, switch this, switch that. You know what I mean? Oh, you got a whole bunch of songs. Oh, yo, these five songs go together. This is way over here. Let's get rid of, let's hold that for this and do whatever. I am a, a great arranger. Mm, that's, I, I, once again, it produces a unique answer and that, and I'm all good with that, uh, especially on this end. I think that it's important for, for producers to understand that beyond the styles that we take on, there is a greater cloud of, not even cloud, but an umbrella that you're basically yeah. serving, right? And you don't always need to know that initially from the beginning. And, and it is a process before you realize, like for myself, I realized that, you know, I find the most happiness uh, sharing and, and, and giving value. Right. And that umbrella includes music. Well, how can I be valuable as a producer? How can I be valuable as, you know, a speaker? Whatever the case may be, it's all under this umbrella. But I think the more you 
get within your career, the more you realize what that umbrella is. Now, yeah. before you became this mastermind arranger, before all these beautiful credits that happened, I know that for every producer, there's a moment where it becomes sort of a low point. And I was hoping that you could share with us a short story of of what you would consider one of your lowest pr music producer moments that um, ultimately led to where you are today. Well, I, I, I guess, you know, it was early on, you know, this, first of all, the, you know, we all know this game is valleys and peaks. You know what I mean? You, you're going to have you're going to have low points. You're going to have high points that get followed by low points. Absolutely. No matter how, quote unquote, successful you get, there are all there is always going to be a, a, a time where you feel like things are going low or you feel like you plateaued. Like, man, why can't I get past this level? You know, right. um, of course, early on for me, it was definitely you know, being an aspiring MC and, and and just trying to make my records and break out. You know, this is before the internet, before social media, before all of that, you actually had to like get out there on the streets. You had to go to every freaking open mic there was. You had to be there, be part of the community for real, show up at parties, support people, blah, 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 blah. And I felt like I got to a certain point where I wasn't um, satisfied. And then, you know, the whole boom, now I got kids, I got this, I got to make money, I got such and such. So you're working a nine to five and you got all this music and, you, and you're and feeling like, man, is this ever going to happen? Like, you know, it's like you get to the point where you want to give up, you know, right. but but it wasn't like an option. You know what I mean? It's like it's calling you. You got to go and you start trying to figure out and then people wouldn't let me and it's like hey man i need this beat and that and i guess that's the period of time where i kind of got more into production because people were always still leaning on me for beats and tracks and whatever mm -hmm. whatever you know fast forward short you know I, I met alicia in the in the mid 90s uh you know she she we vibe at that time you can go out in new york city down uh the village area washington square park area People will freestyle, have all their, you know, ciphers. You meet people, you vibe with them, you connect and be like, yo, people I like to vibe are like, yo, I got a little equipment at my crib. We can make a, we can vibe in the crib or whatever. And I would invite people over and just make cassette tapes. Just run the cassette, wow. record the vibes. And right. I'm on the NPC, you got beats, you, whatever, you want to get on the NPC. And we just make like 90 minutes worth of just vibing. Right. So fast forward that, you know, it came a time where well, Alicia got a, her first deal. She didn't um, like what she was doing with those producers. And she asked me to work with her, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Which is a high point. But, you know, it, it's a whole longer story. And I don't want to, like, draw out so much of the time. But I just break forth past was like, boom. Now I'm getting a chance to work with someone on a major label. Right. To me, I'm learning all this stuff. We're making all this great music. And the, and I'm thinking, okay, it's gonna be soon. I could quit my job, quit my job, right? And, and the label didn't like it. Wow. Now I'm like, oh man, what am I gonna do? What are we gonna do? Yeah. And you're like, oh man. And then it makes you doubt yourself. Because one thing I did want, one thing I do want to make a big point of, since everything kind of happened so fast. And I was a person who always just did stuff. Like I didn't learn how to engineer in a school or whatever. Right. I learned how to engineer by bluffing. Right. I, <laughs> you know, I had my first record deal at 18 years old. Actually, I waited till I was 18 so I could sign the contract by myself. Cause okay. I didn't want to go all this mouth and whatever. <laughs> right. I'm like, I'm this. this is my chance. <laughs> not gonna tell me no. You know what I mean? So um, make a long story short, we used to go to the studio and um, that that the label used to put us to independent label B Boy Records, you know, okay. uh, JBC Force came out of there, BDP, KRS One, D Nice, they all came out of this label. And um, I just remember going to the studio and always paying attention, paying attention. And I had a girlfriend that worked for a booking agency, and she was like, uh, "People are always looking for studio time." And I was like, "Oh, I could get them some studio time." Mm. She's like, "I don't even know why they're calling here. This is for shows." But I was like, "Get their number." So I, I hooked it up with the studio and be like, yo, you know, if I bring some sessions, can I do some sessions and whatever? They, like, yeah, no problem. You know how to engineer? I was like, yeah, I know how to engineer. <laughs> Matter of fact. <laughs> and, you know, first day I kind of bossed it up a little bit, but I figured it out. Right. So I said on it to say that's kind of been like my whole career. It's like even when Alicia came to me, hey, I'm working on an R&B album. 
you know, I need you to work on. I'm like, fuck, I don't know how to do R and B. Right. Like, oh wow. Yeah, so even at that point, let's yeah, even, yeah. That's what, I just knew how to sample, put some beats together. I'm the arranger, remember? Right. So like, okay. So I never really took time to really have real confidence in what I was doing. Mm. So when that disappointment happened, I started feeling like, man, do I have it? Or is it my fault? Like, you know what I mean? So that was right. a very low point for me. Well, music producers, as you're listening, I'm sure that there's your own value that you are getting from it. And I, I tell you, the, some, there's some themes that come to mind as I'm listening, uh, listening to the story. And one of those themes is perseverance. I mean, we hear that a million and one times, but, you know, how many times have you heard the stories of your favorite producers to where simply because they chose to continue going? You know, it seems like such a simple thing to do, but because they continued to go, no matter what the adversity was, they literally put themselves in a position to where it was like, you know, I always look at opportunity as sort of uh, uh, pushing all your strength towards the roof in hopes that it'll open a door. Right. Yeah. You think about a roof. There's no doors on the roof, but you pushing up against this roof and everybody around you can't see the door that's in the roof. But you're pushing all this power in hopes that it'll just crack open a little bit, a little bit of light just so you can get through. And perseverance is definitely a part of that. Um, other things that I get from this is to to be ready when opportunity presents itself, even if you don't feel that your skills are ready. It's important right. to jump in and and. I was always told, you know, my cousin uh, used to tell me because he used to work for death row. He said uh, at many times I had chances to leave uh, when things started getting bad. But I stood I stood there and he said, because in my mind, I was on the right side of history. Mm. And and um, I always always gravitated towards that. But beside from the things that I took from your particular story, what do you think is the biggest theme that producers can learn from your story? It's just it's just. As you said, stay, stay, uh, you know, the perseverance and stay consistent. And the main thing is believe in yourself, man. Mm. And, 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 you know, that sounds cliche, but, you know, we, we, a lot of times we, we might feel like we can't do something or we get frustrated because we compare ourselves to other people. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So what that could do is might, might say that you're not worthy enough or it might say, I'm better than this person. Why is it this happening for me? Either way, it's like you got to get that out of your mind and just focus on where you're at. Mm -hmm. Look at yourself and be like, okay, there's something in me that, that I want to do this and anything you don't feel confident in, you should work on. You know what I mean? Right. And, and, and that's what I pretty much did my whole career. You know, as I said, I bluffed my way, but at the same time, I did take time to learn. I did stay up all night. I did study. I asked a million questions. You know what I mean? Because I said, right. okay, I don't know it now, but I'm going to figure this out. Absolutely. I didn't let that learning curve intimidate me to feel like, oh, man, I can't do this. You know what I mean? Right. But just staying consistent and always learn, man. Always keep learning. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you one of the things that I admire, aside from the stuff that I already knew about your production uh, credits and, and just who you are. I mean, aside from the credits, like the credits are, are, are amazing, but you know, we, we, we've met producers before that have amazing credits, but amazing individuals that just so happen to, you know, uh, uh, and I want, I don't want to make it seem like a chance thing, but they happen to gravitate towards all of these great positive and creative energies. It's not by chance. And I always right. tell producers that success leaves clues for the next question that I had for you. In what different ways have you generated income? Because what I was going to say, the point that I was going to make earlier was that I'm looking at your credits and I see a couple of kids bops that popped up <laughs> in the midst of all this music that you were making is, you know, extremely soulful. I see kids bop and I'm like, that amount of variety is just spectacular. It's amazing to see that within a, a, a credits. What are some different ways that you've been able to generate income as a producer? As a producer, I mean, the, 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 the royalties you get from producing, mm -hmm. the uh, royalties you get from songwriting, you know, the placements you'll get from when your songs get in movies or television. Also doing lectures. I've, I've done lectures. I took my little stab on doing little beat kits. You know what I mean? Right. I'm, I was a little, very late in the game. You know, I, I was still doing a drum kit, but I, I know people want loops and stuff now. Right. <laughs> <But I was laughs> they want you to make it as easy as possible yeah, for them now. Like, <laughs> 
you know, I didn't have enough drag and drop, you know. But, um, <laughs> and and now it now mainly I've I've been doing more consulting. You know what I mean? As far as like that area of things, you know what I mean? But I've, I've been pretty, I've been pretty successful with the catalog and, and it's still active and it's still going, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big person on quality. You know, if you make a great record, it's going to sell forever and have a good value for a long time, as opposed to like, let me just make as much as I can. And you get a, like a, a short, you know, income burst. And then right. like two years later, no one cares. Right. You know I mean? So I've, I've been blessed to have a strong catalog, which which definitely ties over. But as you know, we're in a whole different environment now. So since people are consuming way more music, you have to do more things and you have to be a little more consistent, which me, right. that's where I'm at now. It's like, you know, success is a continuous thing. There is no like, oh, I'm successful. I don't have to do anything anymore. Because <laughs> guess what? The cost of living goes up every year. Yep. <laughs> yep. 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 So. That leads me to my next question, which I mean, you know, having that abundance of information, that abundance of knowledge comes from experience. And right. so I have a two part question. And the first part of that question is, what do you believe is your weakness as a music producer? Weakness. Um, that's a that's a tough one, because, as I said, any weakness I have, I work on. You okay. know what I mean? So. I guess I would say it, it, it could be considered a weakness, well, at least for me. But as again, these days and time, you can work around it. Right. I, I never took time to really learn how to play, play, like play like a musician. Like I never mm. call myself a, a musician because when I produce, I use musicians. And of course, Alicia plays for real, classically trained. Right. And it makes me lazy. I'm like, hey, play this for me. <laughs> 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 like it's going to take me forever to do it. Right. I mean, but who wouldn't when you got Alicia Keys sitting yeah. right there? I mean, it's I like, mean, I, yeah, you know. <laughs> and, and I came up in a, I came up in a, a during my time there were less producers like me. You know, now it's like, who does play? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But at yeah. that time, most of the producers were real musicians. You know what I mean? They they went to church and they did this and did that, and they didn't respect people like me or Timberland or you know whoever else. Mm -hmm. Like I used to hear them like musicians who knew him and was like dog oh he can't play this and this and i'm just like yo what do you think about me <laughs> you know yeah I mean? yeah so, My, right, so <laughs> yeah so that was like an intimidating thing and and it would frustrate because sometimes you can't explain to the musician what you hear or it takes mm -hmm. too long and i was like man if i could just if i could play i could just do it myself right. so i felt like that was probably my my biggest weakness you know what i mean not being able to physically play out what I was hearing, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Okay, so the second part of obviously with that is the inverse. What do you believe is your strength? You know, you, you get in that phone call, they need you to come in here and do this specific thing. What would you feel is your strength as a music producer? Well, it, well, it ties into that, but being that, I, being that I felt that way about me not being a musician, I've actually um, had an opportunity to work with a jazz musician and he sat me down and he said, you know what? He said, you have an ear. He said, you can't learn an ear. He said, you can always learn how to play. Mm -hmm. he said, you can sit there and study and learn whatever <laughs> you can learn. How he said, but you have an ear, you know what I mean? And you need to recognize that. And, and it just opened up the whole nother world for me. So my strength is definitely my ear, you know what I mean? Because okay. true, you have people who can play me under the table, but they can't make a great sounding record. And I didn't understand it. I was like, yo, you could do why? Yeah, that's too much. Like you look, can't hear that. That's too much. <laughs> look, one one of the first producers I ever worked with, um, good buddy of mine, he just a genius when it came to actually putting down chords. He knew all the scales. He knew all this, but when it came to actually putting together a beat, he ran yeah. into many different challenges because it is a different art form entirely. Yeah. It's almost like you know when you look at a producer and you say. You don't know how to mix, and but it's like if you've never approached it as an art form, or right. it's never been a part of your art uh, artillery. Yeah, they, they don't know how to mix, but it, it right. you know it's it's something where you're spot on with it, and that I've even been I've had those situations where you know uh, I, I've been told like the fact that I have not learned how to play, you know, right. it's almost like get this guy out of here until yeah. you show me your value, and they're like, oh, you don't you don't read music now. That it's to the right. point where there's so many different tools. Uh, right. One of which that I, I just recently saw called Scalar, where 
you literally can just finger through whatever keys that sound good and then it'll turn around and show you all the possible chords <laughs> And I'm yeah. like, if I had that at, at yeah. 17, 18, yes. Yes. Um, it would have been a completely different game. But everything happens for a reason. And transitioning, I want to ask you, what do you think was the biggest thing holding you back from being successful? The success that you are today as a music producer? At that time, it was the attitude. Mm. The attitude. Because you, you get to the point, as I said, you, you don't realize... Well, for me, I didn't realize what my gift was. Like, mm -hmm. like someone had to tell me, no, you got the air. Like, someone had to tell me, it's like, yo, you're a fast learner. Like, mm -hmm. you know how to get people together and make them, like, I overlooked all of those things. Right. My thing was like, oh, man, I can't do this like this person. Oh, man, I wish I could do this. And and then also being this, you know, you get to a point where you will get a little disgruntled. You're, you're like, man, I'm doing all this, all this. And nobody's recognizing me. Nobody's recognizing me. You know, I, I went through the period of that early in my career. It's like, man, right. my, I've been doing that five years ago. Why nobody, you know? So I had the wrong attitude. It's almost like, what, what was that movie? Jerry Maguire. Oh, that yes. Player, <laughs> like that, but he had the wrong attitude. Uh -huh. was like me. I had the wrong attitude. I, I was worried about the wrong things. You know what I mean? Mm. And, it, and it frustrated me. And it, it kind of, and you know, once you have the wrong attitude, you start losing patience and, and you stop kind of doing the very thing that got you, you know, to, to progress. Right. Your, you know what I mean? So to me, that was what was holding me back from success, the wrong attitude. You know, and once I changed that, everything just opened doors, man. Gratitude is the key, man. Absolutely. And, and and it's funny because one of the most brilliant marketing minds that I ever met uh, was by accident when I decided to take a marketing course in college. And my intentions were to go to college to go for a music production uh, you know, certificate. Right. I couldn't get in because it was full. So then I was like, well, I kind of heard about this marketing thing. I'm going to need to know how to market myself. Let me go learn about it. And there's a professor that I met in one of the first classes that we had. He sat us down and he said, um, the last 15 minutes of class, you have the choice to leave or to stay, but it's going to be the most important lesson that I ever give you. And you know what that lesson was? It was dealing with how your attitude determines your altitude. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that you shared that because I think a lot of producers, especially within my generation or even younger than me, they have this mindset that comes off a lot like entitlement. Exactly. And that they're owed certain things. I'm owed this. I'm owed that. You know, I don't need to go work for this because I'm I'm better than this person, I'm nice. and I'm nice, yeah, right? I can, and I can you, say better than this person. Exactly. I can, you, you, I can actually play. <laughs> and, and, and it's almost like the American Idol syndrome. Still, that was nothing. <laughs> yeah, I call it the American Idol syndrome, yeah. and that people look on TV and they say, "Oh, she's not that." I, Man, yeah. I probably can go on there and blow everybody out the water, but it's just, yeah. it's not just about that one thing that you're focused on. So I really hope that producers understand that, you know, you don't glance over this, this, this part about the attitude is that that is stopping a lot of people who have all the talent in the world. That attitude is what's holding them back. Uh, I, I just want to uh, interject sure. a little more because I, I, I know an artist now who's very, very talented and whatever. He, he still has the wrong attitude. It's like mm. you, have, you have people, as you said, feel entitled. And you can't get away from people comparing you to other artists. Sure. You know, or people that seems like, oh, they're from where you're from and blah, 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 blah. And I said to him, because at first, at first I didn't know what exactly was holding him back. And then I got to know him. And then I said, OK. I said, well, what do you think about, oh, I'm better than, oh, that, oh, that, that and everything. And these were some great artists. Mm -hmm. And he had this attitude like, ah, but that's, uh, that's the tip. I was like, wow, this guy has no peers. Mm -hmm. He has peers, but he alienates himself. That attitude is like, I don't want to be associated with them. I don't want people to think I'm like them. You're going to prove that from you doing your thing. Absolutely. But you're pushing away from, from it. It's actually hurting you because... You know, one of his biggest uh, uh, influences, or, or he's a big fan of Kanye West. I said, you're missing the main point of him. You look at Kanye West, who started out as a producer. He worked with all the underground artists. Then he does a song with T-Pain. Then he does a song with such and such. 
Nowhere wow. in the world did you say, why is why is Kanye working with them? He, he samples soul loops. What is he doing on this trap beat? Right. He's got the right attitude. He's like, I'm working with everyone. You're not mm-hmm. gonna put me in this thing. And 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 it worked for his benefit. So that's what I'm saying about attitude. It's like, okay, you might not want to be compared to this person that someone says is whatever, but you can't do anything by yourself. It's a community right. thing. You know, instead of being like, ah, whatever. Look at what you do like about it and work with that person. You know right. what I mean? That's what I mean about attitude in, a, in another way. It's not just it's not just about, you know, having it for yourself, but having it towards everybody and having it towards like, you know, that sense of like we all need each other. Yeah. You know? and, and don't feel like you working with this something, this this personal style that might not be exactly what you're into is going to, you know, uh, uh, jeopardize your integrity. Or whatever, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So you know, I'm probably I went on a little tangent. No, no, you, we we needed that. We we this you know the audience needs that because there's somebody out there right now who is in the same boat as that artist that you're working with, and that they're in this this constant state of comparing themselves. They're in this constant state of saying, you know, um, why isn't this person doing this for me, or, or, or why why am I not given the same opportunity? I should be on sway in the morning. Why are they not giving me a shot? People are hating on me in that well, mentality. Person, because I never yeah like and, and speak and the thing is I, I I used to talk to rappers, me being a rapper and producer, I used to talk to rappers all the time who would make these plans for like five years down the line and it's partly commendable because it's like i'm glad you have that much confidence in yourself but it's like you you don't realize where you're at right now you got to really humble yourself and realize that this is the community that you're around now you better respect the people who are here because ultimately they're going to be a contributor to you getting where you ultimately want to get to but now we need if any if anything needs to be expanded upon it's that attitude aspect and i'm all i'm always here for it Start where you at. It's like, you know, I would tell people, I was like, my cousin would call me, yo, I got this guy, yo, he's down here in South Carolina, such and such and such. I was like, do people in South Carolina know him? (laughs) He's like, no. I said, if he booked a a, a show, can he get 100 people to come by and and pay $10 to see him? No, but he nice. He nice, though. (laughs) <laughs> but look, I was like, yo, if you can't make it in your own environment, what mm-hmm. makes you think you're going to like bypass that mm-hmm. and get to the national and international level? It's you an know, obsession. You, know, you might not like the people in your yeah. town, but you got to You got to. I call it I call it an obsession with being the exception. Right. right? right. And, and people always have in their mind that I'm going to be that one guy who did it this way. I'm yeah. going to be the one guy that became successful yeah. by spamming my music. I know nobody else, but I'm going to be that one guy. And what they got to realize is that just the way you think you're that one guy, there's somebody who thinks that they're that one woman. They think that they're one. Right. Everybody's right. pushing for this. Right. Why why uh, sacrifice valuable time you know, using this particular risk when you could be risking something else and it has a more secure, like there's calculated risk to take. What I want to ask you next is what is the best music producer advice that you think you've ever received? I liked uh, Quincy Jones' advice. Mm-hmm. It was, is there, a, is there a piece of music that you love, that you're really excited about, to copy it? You know, mm. what, what is it, like still like an artist? Yeah. You know what I mean? He said, because what you'll do, you'll figure out what it, what it is about it that you like and what resonates with you. And you're not going to do it exactly because you're your own unique person. Mm-hmm. He said, copy it and 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 expand off of that. Mm-hmm. And to me, it was a great advice and it was also a confirmation because in the beginning, when I was learning how to produce, that's what I would do. I was like, man, I love this beat. Let me try to make it. Let me try to recreate it. So that that was the best advice to be like, you know, you don't have to like, let me just pull something out of nowhere. Start from, you know, what, what resonates with you and figure out why does it resonate? And expand right. on that. Once again, you just you just raining gems all over this particular interview, and and I'm I'm glad to be the recipient okay. of these gems here because I know there's a lot of producers who are just sitting here like probably still in amazement from last oh, week. We, and, uh-huh. and, Go ahead. But that doesn't mean the tight beats. I have nothing to get tight beats. Oh no no no. We but, no we we but absolutely. It, but it's different. <laughs> the difference when you're trying to copy someone uh-huh. to get the money. Yeah. Copy what you love. Yeah. That's the key point. Copy what you love and resonates with you. Don't copy it because, oh, this is what's selling. That's yeah. a difference. 
Let's let's. I just that's want to clear that up. No, no, that's and that's important to too. That that's important because I always share with the audience that you know when you're trying to find your sound, all the only thing that you have to go off of because we don't have textbooks that tell you how to produce like a Timberland, how to produce like right. the Crucial Keys. We don't have textbooks that show us that in the same way that if you want to become a lawyer, there's a book that you go to. There's a test that you take. And then yep. you can be known as a lawyer or a real estate agent. But right. because that doesn't exist, all you have are the references of music that has come before you. So if you have that as references, what I what I have always said, in, in addition to what uh, Quincy Jones said, and that quote is copy, copy until you hate it. And when you start mm. to hate things, you start to find what is your particular sound. You start to realize, like, I don't like the hi-hats in this particular beat. Yeah. What would I do differently? And then you start yeah. asking those questions. You start to start to carve out your own sound within it. What I was going to ask you is what what in studio habit do you think contributes to your success with the artists that you work with? From the beginning, even with Alicia, you start the session off just playing your favorite music. Mm. Just, play, just vibe out. You know, I usually ask the artist, yo, what you listening to? What's your favorite? Like, what do you know? What's your favorite now and what's your old favorites? Mm. And what it does, it just creates this great atmosphere. You're vibing with your favorite songs and you're happy and such and such. Okay, cut it off. Let's go. <laughs> it always works because now it's all in your vibe, your energy. Now you're feeling good. You're enthusiastic. You know what I mean? And and that word, uh, you know, I can't break it down, but enthusiastic is is uh, the base word is of Latin and Greek and, and it means through God. You know, mm. through God. So when you're enthusiastic about something, it's going to come out pretty good, you know, if not great. You know what right. I mean? So my, my main habit is I don't start a studio session. Okay, here we are. Let's just go through this and make something. Like, yo, right. let's vibe a little bit. Let's play, let's play some music. So that that's probably my my main my main um, studio rituals. Like, let's start it off by vibing 15 minutes, 30 minutes, sometimes an hour. I mean, the song Unthinkable, it was, it was so great. It's like... Everybody had their laptops up. It was Alicia, it was 40, it was Drake, and Swiss was there, I was there, and we all playing like, yo, you know this record though? And <laughs> we just going oh, back wow. and forth, back and forth, just playing our favorites. It was yeah. like a DJ competition a little bit. And it was like, okay, let's stop. And then all of a sudden, dun, dun, and hey, the rest is history. So we, one of my favorite Quincy Jones quotes is where he basically said to, if you have in a studio session a window, leave it crack and let God come in, right? And so when I heard this quote, it was something that kind of just stopped me in my tracks because in my mind, I was like, well, what do you mean when you say let God come in? And I think uh, everybody has their definition of what they believe God to be. And this is not really a, necessarily a religious conversation, but in that sense, some people use like, it may be alcohol. Some people may use, you know, uh, uh, weed or whatever the case may be to kind of feel their their most relaxed and most open self. And so they use that to basically use the same example of cracking that window to let God come in. And so yeah. when I looked at that, I said, huh, in what ways am I allowing God to come in? And I think that it's those moments where you play yeah. that music and you vibe in and you guys are talking to each other. Like you said, you're talking to 40 and Drake and you're, you're talking and you're like, you know, have you heard this? Oh, you ever heard this? Oh man, wait till I pull this up. And then yeah. like, Ooh, that sounds beautiful. Yeah. That, that has to transfer through the art that comes out. Right. And when you start thinking about the, the song that came as a result of that beautiful song, I, it makes sense knowing yes. that that was the, the, the order of events for that song to come together. Uh, and that's something I wanted to ask you too. And this is, this is aside from the list, but uh, how is it working with Alicia Keys? Um, it's like working with your family. It's like working with another extension of yourself, mm -hmm. you know, because as I, um, a lot of people don't know that that first album pretty much took five years in the making. You know, um, I started working with her like 96, 97 and her first album didn't come out to 2001. Oof. So it's like when you work with someone that long, it's just like, I don't need to ask her. I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you get that connection. And I feel like that that is like a, a, a one main thing that uh, is kind of missing a lot in today's music is like, oh, send out a track, send out a track. But if you really get that moment in time with that artist and really get to know them before you even start to do music, mm -hmm. it comes so much easier. So it was like, it became, it's like second nature working with her. You know, I, I remember when um, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis 
said when they when they started working with Janet Jackson for the Control album, her first album, which she got permission to do what she want. He <laughs> said, we just hung out for two weeks before we even did one session. Wow. And, and, and that's what it is. It's like they took two weeks to really get into where she's at, what she want, whatever, whatever. Of course, in today's market, it's like we don't got that money to be paying for hotel Airbnb for you to chill for two weeks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and I think it's, it's it's that mix up where creatives are having conversations with professionals and professionals, are, they're both speaking a different language. And yeah. it's like you got to let the creatives do what they do right. in the right. same way that creatives sometimes can overstep their boundaries with the business, you yeah. know, uh, to where certain people do certain things because they've been in it for so long. What are some book? It could be either a book, a movie or a documentary that you suggest to music producers to check out. That has been very inspirational for you. Oh, a book. I mean, man, there's a whole list of books. I mean, any autobiography you can get yourself on like, hands to, like uh, uh, you know, Russell Simmons book. I forget the name of the book, but he has a book. Quincy Jones has a few books. Any 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 producer, any veteran in this business that you know. Like get their book. Kevin Lyles has a book. I think Make It Happen, uh, the new one, The Tanning of America by Steve Stout. But then also, I think it was it's this book that breaks down, especially on a on a hip hop level, to kind of show you where everything come from and really gets you to understand how this hip hop industry started. It's called The Big Payback. Mm, I've seen it on my Amazon recommendations. I haven't checked it yeah. out though. The Big Payback by Dan uh, Char... How do you pronounce his name? Uh, Charnes. Yeah, Charnes. Mm -hmm. And it breaks down like hip hop from the beginning, from when it was on the parks and how people started making money from booking it in the clubs and how people who did, you know, disco was big then and how they looked down on the hip hop. It was like, oh, that's kiddie music because disco was more sophisticated, how it got to the radio how pop radio embraced it before black radio, like black radio was totally against hip hop. Right. And it show you the progress and then shows you all the deals and shows you to me how many people who weren't part of the culture made so much money from the culture. Mm. And it, it just it just really opens opens up a lot of things. I recommend every producer and even artists to just really check this out. And it kind of gives you an overall view on how it works and, and it might, you know, help you make your plan and your decision on how you see yourself and part of it. Right. And and it kind of caught up because you see the whole climate of what Jay Z's doing and like, you know, Diddy's reaching out to different people and it's like, you know what, we need to start controlling our destiny. Absolutely. We need to start controlling our narrative. And you know, Dame Dash been talking about it forever. Culture vultures, culture vultures. <laughs> and it's true. Like this this music started from you know the disadvantages and from the lack of you know what i mean and we created something that is still the most consumed and streamed music in the world today mm -hmm. and we still don't have our own major label it's crazy <laughs> and then also look at the the cash money documentaries and the mm. master p documentaries and um you know, Defiant Ones is definitely a great, great one. Standing in the Shadows of Motown. I think that was another mm. one uh, where, where it was about the musicians and how they created the sound and the work that they put in. And right. you know, those those type of documentaries, I would say definitely check out, man. Yeah. When you're in your spare time, check out those doc invest in something that's going to feed you, you know, you know, it's all fun to look at the memes and go on and find <laughs> out, you know, what Who's cheating on Chloe? That's all right. fine. But if it's not something that benefits you to help you grow, mm -hmm. spend a little time doing that a little more than staring at your phone, scrolling and gossip and all that. You know, gotta, I mean? gotta feed the soul. Gotta yes. feed the soul. And yes. I think that's that's one thing that I even see lacking from, uh, you know, uh, the <clears throat> a, a lot of young producers that I talk to. You know, their souls are already they're already feeling empty. They're already feeling, you know, because they don't they're not having enough influences, enough things like when I was coming up, I had many different things to pull from that that gave me inspiration, uh, even at a young age, uh, being able to to have access to, you know, my mom's Les Brown tapes or being able to have access to different things where it was like, you know what? 
I know this may not be the cool thing right now for people my age, but I just kind of want to listen to it. Even listening to AM radio, and uh, I remember listening and they used to do these sort of like uh, almost like plays over the uh, the station and just learning how people tell stories through audio, use, yes. hearing sound design in these stories. Yeah. These yeah. are things that built, yeah. you know helped me. They were so far removed from what I did that it didn't feel like I was at work. It felt like I was just feeding my soul. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, I... I, I even uh-huh. coming up is like, you know, that's another thing. Get out of your comfort zone. Um, get out of what you usually listen to. Like even me coming up, of course, I listened to these, you know, stations down the dial. They would play a lot of soul music that I didn't hear. Some I knew from my parents. But then I used to listen to blues station, like an hour of blues. Right. And it really helped me come up with ideas for my production because it was something that was new to me. You know what I mean? Right. I'm, all the, and, and the average person is not listening to blues all night. Like, what are you right. listening? To? Why are you listening? You know what I mean? But that's another genre that great with storytelling. It's great with emotion. Simple chords and it was it three chords in the truth. You yeah, know what I mean? That that's that's what they really give you help. every single time, and it has worked. It stood the right. test of time, and it says a lot about the power of um of that genre, and also the power of sometimes. We get so many different VSTs, so many different yeah. pieces of equipment, so much, so many things we think we have to do that we forget that, you know, the music is something you feel. The music is yeah. something that at the end of the day, you just got to keep it simple. That's why I love that saying that the, the yeah. kiss, keep it simple, stupid. You know, and, and a lot of way, a lot of times I got to tell myself to this day, still yeah. keep it simple. You overcomplicating this entire yeah. process. Because a lot of us got this idea of like, oh, that was easy. That's nothing. I was like, yo. Whoever said music was supposed to be hard? Where did you get that from? Yeah. Where did you get this from? That's a <laughs> dumb philosophy you got. You know what I mean? Because it does take a talent to make something simple where it's still great and not cheesy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So don't look at it as like, oh, that's just simple. But you didn't do it. Yep. You know, like even when you see these videos, how to make a trap song in 10 minutes, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you can copy it, but you didn't come up with that. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. So Absolutely. Don't discredit it. Don't discredit it because it's easy or simple. You know right. what I mean? You've always been an advocate for the independence. And and I think that it's it's so important that producers are being experienced, not experienced, but being exposed to different ways of doing things. Now, I know that you, well, at least I assume that mm-hmm. you prefer to have these in-studio sessions. But like you said, the industry has changed. A lot of artists you know, want you to sort of send stuff in and at least to get the the network building up, right? So send stuff through the email. I want to I want to ask you this: if you have any advice for young producers who are trying to get their foot in the door of this industry, if they had to send three beats, what is your philosophy? Not the type of beats, but sort of the philosophy they should have of what to send, because they get so scared. Like, should I send my 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 banger should i send something that sounds like a, what they worked on on their last album what is your what would you say is your philosophy that you would share would, with them i would say well, well i have i have a twofold answer for that mm-hmm. because i'm i'm more bigger on if you want to get discovered as a producer find an artist that you believe in and work on a mixtape or ep or something because this uh, displays your 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 sound, your talent, but it also shows people you know how to put together a project, mm. which is more important to me. You know what I mean? Because as I said, you know, my first thing that I was known for was the Lisa Keys album. I've been producing forever, giving beats and whatever, whatever, and I got to a certain plateau. I couldn't get past a certain point mm. because it's spread thin and whatever the case may be. Most of the producers you know now, from the Timberlands to the Swizzes to whatever, we know them because they work with a key artist, whether it be Aaliyah or whether it be DMX or even Metro Boomin doing a take with OJ the Juice Man and, and, and different ones. It's like they've done projects with these people. They've done mixtapes, which is still a project. Mm-hmm. So I would recommend that first. And, and, it's, and then it's more something you can have a little more control over. Because the thing about sending out tracks, sometimes it got to go through too many hands and too many, you know, gatekeepers, the manager don't like it or the publisher, whatever, whatever. Right. But if you are going to go that route, thanks to technology, I would look, I would say, okay, I want to work with this artist. 
I would look at their interviews. I would read their interviews. I would watch the things and I would listen to what they say and see what motivates them. You know what mm. I mean? And, and, and try to, and, and then you are, as a producer, you're a creator. So you should think like, what would I do for them that's lacking? Don't get so much into trying to do exactly what they have already because they got people to do that. Mm -hmm. Look to say like, man, they would sound good on this type of track. Why did why they never rapped on this or, or sung on this type of thing? That's what you should kind of push towards them and use, you know, parts of what you picked up on the interview. Like, for example, oh, this rapper loved Marvin Gaye. Oh, why don't you kind of get some Marvin Gaye? <laughs> oh, it's real. It's real. It's those yeah. You know what I mean? Or well, they're into rock, but they never rapped on a rockish type. You know what I mean? Use that to your advantage. Get more into the psyche. So it's almost like having that advantage of having them in the studio with you and vibing that in person and using online to compensate for that. You know what I mean? That's genius. <laughs> That's genius because it's digging deeper into who they are as a person. I think a lot of producers look at artists sometimes as just uh, numbers, you know, a, a term that people are like redefining now is the term clout. And I feel like, uh, it's, you know, people say something about clout chasing. I think people look at everybody like they have their own clout score. Like if yeah. I work with this artist, they're going to get my Instagram followers going crazy. Yeah. If I work yeah. with this artist, I can at least get, you know, they're not necessarily yeah. thinking about them as a human being, as a creative. And so when you approach anything, like even now, it's a challenge for me sometimes when I see some of the trollery that comes on my on my uh, my YouTube. And yeah. I read somewhere that said, before you respond back to a comment, say I love you in your right. head. <laughs> it will change right, the right, entire right. way that's that you that's approach that's it, right? <laughs> and it's like it's so hard when somebody's just like calling you out your name and all this stuff. Yeah. But yeah. that's that's the point is that when you're thinking about these artists, think about it as if this is your artist. Yeah. And, 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 and just like Crucial Kids was saying, like, you got to make sure that you're looking at it from a strategic place saying, well, if you like Nirvana, why have you never wrapped over or, uh, you know, smells like teen spirit uh, a, a replay or whatnot. And you have the ability to replay that. You got a guitar player that can play some yeah. of the riffs and then yeah. give you separate yourself from them by literally sitting for 15 to 20 minutes learning about who they are as an individual. They're more yeah. than just their fame. You know, they're more than, yeah. than just, they have, you know, places that they go and grab inspiration from just like you. So just treat them as human beings, I think is such a crucial thing that, no pun intended, a crucial thing yeah. that you have shared with us uh, with that particular uh, story. So what words of advice do you have for up and coming producers? Now, Pretty simple, stay consistent. Stay consistent. And it's so hard to when you don't see any money from it or you don't see any recognition from it. Mm -hmm. But it only really takes one record that can change your life. And you don't know which one that is. Mm -hmm. uh, stay consistent even when you get a little bit of success or a little bit of uh, notoriety. Stay consistent because things forever evolve and change. Um, you know, it, 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 like you said, like some people are like, oh, man, do I send my bangers or do I send? always send your bangers? If you are a producer, or you are a musician and you're creative, you're going to create thousands, if not almost a million songs. Don't hang on to these little ideas because you think this is the one that's going to do it. <laughs> like that. That's that's a lot of us get caught up in like this is fire like yeah. <laughs> who and then nobody wants that track and you're like what's wrong with everybody this is the yeah. and then you're like oh that one you like that one <laughs> so, so stay and 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 leave some space leave some space because as I said if if it was up to me I'd be Jay Z you know what I mean right. it's like what do you mean work on your R and B album I got my rap shit what are you talking about like stay open. Stay consistent, stay open, and just, you know, keep doing what you have to do to enjoy what you're doing. You know, mm. I mean, it's even for me, and I speak to other vets, you know, where you get to this point, you're like, man, I, I'm sick of this music shit, sick, sick of this such and such. And then you realize it's like, you know, and this is for the older producers or producers doing it longer as well. It's just like you get to this point where you're like, man, I don't even like doing music no more because you have this expectation in your mind of where you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to be doing. 
and you forget the very reason why you started in the first place. Once again, it's another episode of the Curtis King Podcast. Thank you for all those that have been tuning in. If you're tuning in to Apple Podcasts, please leave us a five-star rating. Leave us a comment. Let us know how we're doing. Let the other people know who are thinking about listening to this, that this is worth listening to. For rappers out there that are looking for production, you already know I got your back, curtiskingbeats.com. For producers looking for drum kits and how to build your own producer website course, go to musicproducerwebsite.com. For rappers and producers that need one-on-one coaching, your man's got you. Curtis King, your boy, I got you. One-on-one with CurtisKing.com will take you straight there. We'll get to either doing a 30-minute session. I've even opened up a 45-minute session. And I have a, a one-hour session. Okay, you can get more information on that by going to one-on-one with CurtisKing.com or just go to CurtisKingBeats.com. I got all that there. In this life, you won't be full of life until you decide to live life to its fullest. Curtis King of CurtisKingBeats.com.